Welcome back to another video on using the Target Scheduler plugin in Nina. In this third video, we're going to look at how to construct a sequence that works at a higher level of automation. As you can see from the screen, if the roll-off roof closes at the moment, there's going to be an unhappy accident. So we need to think about parking the, the mount so it's safe and opening the closing the roof um, when the conditions are poor. So I'm going to show how to do that in Nina. And just before I do that, I just want to point out that in this particular roll-off roof setting, I have two sensors that detect whether the roof is open and closed. And I also have a sensor on the end of the telescope that reflects off the wall to prove that the telescope is flat and horizontal and not sticking above the roof line. We're going to open Nina and take a look at a more advanced sequence. In the Target Scheduler page, we can see the now familiar projects that we've been using for the earlier two videos, which includes exposure profiles, projects, and a list of Messier targets. In this new advanced sequence, I'm going to use some of the other plugins to help me, one of which is Sequence of Power Ups. This one adds a number of very useful instructions to the standard sequencer, one of which is if unsafe, which is not a loop condition, but a conditional instruction. So if we go into the sequencer, I've previously loaded a roll off roof sequence, and I'm going to step through it and explain what I'm doing and why. In the startup section, I have a number of standard controls, one of which is to connect the equipment, one is to open the roof and initialize the mount. This is a paramount, and so therefore it requires homing before you can slew. And then we start to have some more interesting ones. We cool the observatory down, waiting for dusk, and I'm doing dusk minus 20 minutes, and this is the start of my imaging time. One of the interesting things here is using one of these additional instructions. When becomes unsafe is a conditional instruction. So while the roof is open and it's cooling down, if it becomes unsafe, I park the scope, close the shutter, wait until it's safe, wait a few seconds and then open again. And that manages the, the unsafe condition. It continues on and waits until dusk. Once it's got to dusk, it's almost ready to do imaging. And in this last little part of the startup, I'm using the other instruction called if safe. And if safe, it opens the shutter unparks the scope, slews to an arbitrary Alt-As to do focusing, runs an autofocus and then parks the scope. And in this way, if it's not been used for a while, the focus will be pretty good for the following commands. We now come on to the main imaging section. And we have two sets of instructions. We have safe imaging conditions and then a hibernation. Let's take a look at the hibernation first. This is what I use when there are unsafe conditions. So I send myself a message. I stop guiding, park the scope, wait a few seconds to make sure that the scope is registering park, close the shutter, which is the roof. Again, send a message that everything's hibernating. I wait until safe. I wait five minutes. If it's still safe, I can open the shutter and then it'll come back out of here and go around to the beginning again. The loop condition is one of the new target scheduler conditions, which is while targets remain tonight. And it'll keep on going around this loop. If it's safe, it'll do some imaging. And if it's unsafe, it will go into here. And the reason it will go into here is because at the beginning of my safe imaging conditions, it has a loop condition that says loop while safe. So as soon as it becomes unsafe, it will pop out of this safe imaging conditions loop and go into my hibernation one. Otherwise, this looks fairly familiar. We have the triggers for guiding, meridian flips and autofocus outside of the target scheduler. We have loop while safe, which we've just discussed. We have the target scheduler condition, which is while targets remain tonight. And while you may think that duplicates the one up here, 
The reason that there are two is that this also manages periods when it's unsafe as well, whereas this is only handling when it's safe. If we scroll down the screen, we have the familiar center after drift trigger within the target scheduler. And to make things more snappy, if we suddenly had to close the roof, during a wait period, if we are pausing between targets, it would be sensible to park the scope and unpark the scope either side of the wait condition. At the point in time when you run out of night or you run out of targets that can be imaged, either this loop condition or the one up here will end things and it will pass through to the shutdown sequence which parks the mount and shuts the roof and turns off all the equipment. While still on the subject of safety management, you also need to consider what happens if the mount and the roof do not operate correctly. In the HiveMate section, on Park Scope, you'll see that it tries two attempts. And if I expand this out, you'll see that if it fails, on error, it simply aborts. It doesn't want to try to do anything else. Equally, if there's an error condition, it sends a message to pushover, which comes up on an iPad that lies next to my bed. Now, on the open dome shutter, there should also be some error management, and there isn't. So we need to open that up, and we need to think about this. If the shutter doesn't open, you do not want to slew the mount. So therefore, on error, it needs to be abort. And now I can save that sequence for future reference. One thing I do need to say is that this sequence works in my roll-off roof, but not all roll-off roofs are the same. Mine has a number of safety interlocks, and I've tested this thoroughly before using it. You need to check your sequences with your equipment, and I would recommend you doing a dry run where you're around at the time with your hand over the power switch to cut the power in case something goes wrong and the roof tries to close into a mount or the mount tries to swing into the roof and so forth. So with that disclaimer in mind, we can move on and look at some of the other aspects of automation in an observatory environment. There are a few more settings that we've glossed over in the previous two videos that help with the automation process. In the plugins tab, these are associated with how many pictures are taken for any particular target and when each target is optimally imaged. If we click on a particular profile and see the projects listed underneath it, you can see that there is a priority setting for each project. So for instance, if I go into Messier Marathon, you can see that the priority is set to normal and I can change that between low, normal and high. Equally, for that particular project, I can set a number of priorities in regard to the project and the targets that are within it. If we take a look at these five rule weights, we can change the way the planner decides which targets to do when. The first one, percent complete, allows us to prioritize targets that are almost complete over starting a new one. The project priority allows us to add further weighting to a particular project in addition to the standard priority up here. And it allows us to, when we have a mix of targets, to give the target additional weight. The target switch penalty is a way of preventing you flipping between targets too rapidly so that you are wasting an awful lot of time of slewing and centering and so forth. And this basically, a high value of this, reduces the number of target changes in any one night. Equally, the setting soonest is a way of making sure that we don't lose a target for its season by allowing it to set whilst we're doing something that has only just risen. So again, a high value of this is a good way of making sure that you achieve the required number of exposures for a target that is one of the earliest ones to set in the season. And lastly is the meridian window priority. 
A project can either have the Meridian window set or not set. To unset the Meridian window, this is set to zero. So you may have several live projects for a particular profile that are running on any one night. And this setting will tell you whether it tries to do those projects that have the Meridian window set over those that don't. And before we leave this page, there's one other little control that's been modified in the latest version of the plugin, and that is regard to how it manages minimum horizons. You can use a custom horizon, the same as Nina uses for its imaging, and you can also have a minimum altitude. And what happens in the latest version of the plugin is that that threshold will be the maximum of either of these two. So if my custom horizon falls below 45 degrees, it will still honor the minimum altitude of 45 degrees for a target to start or finish imaging at. We can now move on to the second group of controls that manage the exposure count for any particular target. If we click on one of these targets, we can see the desired number of exposures, the number that are acquired, and number that's accepted. And this can be manually edited. So for instance, when we set up the project in the first place, we told it how many were desired in each case. And as images come in, they are either accepted or rejected. This can be done manually or automatically. The acquired is done automatically by the system as the exposures come in. So for instance, if I want to change this, I can change that back to five and say that all were good. The number in the accepted column is either done manually, typically after an imaging session, or it can be done by an image grader. The image grader gives an indication of what it thinks is a reject image but it isn't gospel. Let's take a look at image grading and how image grading manual and automatic works practically. To do manual image grading, we need to look at the project and see that we've got the image grader has been enabled. To do manual, we need to turn that off. If we do that, then we need to also consider how many exposures we take, especially if we forget to grade an image after a particular night, and typically there may be one or two rejects in there. So under the profile settings, there is something called an exposure count throttle. So if we're doing manual grading, this means it will continue to take exposures 125% more than the number that you said were desired. And that's based on the assumption that some will be reject. If you do automatic rejects, this exposure count throttle is ignored. To do automatic grading, we take our project and we can edit it and we can enable the grader. And if I now save that and look at the profile settings, our grading preferences are within the profile rather than the project. We have here a number of attributes that are used to decide whether the system thinks an image is reject or not. And it's based on the RMS guiding error. It's also based on the star count and also the star size. There are a couple of things that tell you how sensitive it is to variation. There are two standard deviation factors here for star size and star count, and there's also an RMS pixel threshold for the guider. The default for the guider is quite large. For my shorter telescopes, I'm typically under a pixel for the RMS guiding error, typically under 0.5 of a pixel, so I set this to one to be safe. The max grading samples value is a little tricky to understand, so I need to explain how the grader works. After several images have been taken, it starts to calculate the sigma values for the star size and count, and also check if the pixel guider error has gone too far. 
It does that until it gets to 10 samples in this case, after which it just looks at the last 10 samples to grade the current image. The reason for that is that it allows for slow changing alterations to these parameters, but it doesn't allow short excursions. So if a sudden cloud appears, it will cause a sudden reduction in star count and those images are likely to be rejected. So in other words, it's looking for special causes rather than common causes. The results of the image grader are shown in the acquired images tab. So you can see here there was a reject for star count and it has 26 stars as opposed to 32. There's lots of causes for that. It may be cloud, it may be a loss of focus as well, although the HFR looks still good. But sometimes it's caused by things like a plane trail going over that confuses the star algorithm. But the calibration and rejection in PixInsight, for instance, may make that frame perfectly acceptable. So in this case, you might want to take a look at this frame and if it's still good, go in and manually change it to being good. So we go into M96 along here and where it's there, it looks like one's been rejected. We could manually change that to an eight and say it's still good. I think that brings us to the end of the automation. There are further things going on behind the scenes, one of which is to look at whether we can use the target scheduler and the synchronization plugin that would allow this to run on a dual system, which would be rather exciting. But that's for another day and another video. Thank you for watching.